unidentifiable flying object. UFO continues to be a mystery. Wasn't alone in space. Sightings of UFO. Something out there. Close enough to be observed. What could it be? It could only be one thing. A UFO. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 104 of UFO No, your break from the propaganda, the bad news, the treasonous politicians. Time to get elevated and speculate about the Petra Zavatsk jellyfish. That is a mouthful, folks. Let me tell you, I had to practice a few times just to get that right so I can nail it right off the bat. I want to thank you all for joining the show. We are cruising in the stratosphere. I'm joined by Nathan Boldly Gone Higby as the huge. What's going on, baby? What it is. How you doing, man? What's going on? Oh, man, I'm good. Flying high tonight. Flying high. Let me just tell you, this is we're recording this the day before Thanksgiving, Wednesday night, around 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Nate just got off work. <laughs> Yeah. So did I. But we wanted to bang this out because it's going to be a busy weekend for everybody. And uh, didn't want to miss an episode. Wanted to make sure and get it to you guys. You know why? Because I fucking love you. That's why. But it's uh, called Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And we love you. So therefore, we're giving you the episode instead of cheaping out and being like, no episode this week, guys. We just made it work. We just made it work. But like, Dedication. That's right. Like Nate said, cruising the stratosphere. About, uh, I don't know, I'm about 102. Where are you at, Nate? I'm about 95 and climbing higher. Oh, hey! There we go. If you like the show, be sure to share this episode. Give a nice review. Everywhere you can give a nice review. That's Audible, Apple iTunes, Spotify, and a whole bunch of other places. In fact, Spotify, you don't even have to quit listening to the episode. You can just go right out. Go right up there, do five stars, and just add it to the pile of the others. Thank you very much. Shower that love. Shower it, Bukaki. Shower it. Bukaki Uh, that love. And no matter where you're listening slash watching, except this one is going to be straight audio, but I'm still going to throw it on the YouTubes. Uh, If you're watching, you're listening, hit that subscribe button. Be sure to follow and make sure to catch every new episode. The moment it comes out, uh, I'm going to start putting out the episodes on Mondays, bumping it up one day. Uh, I just need the weekend guys to put it together. That's all. So anyways, Mondays, uh, but, but if you click that link in the show notes, the portal to all things UFO, no, you will find the link to the patreon.com slash UFO, no podcast where you get bonus episodes. You get early access to the episodes before Monday. And, uh, like, uh, we're going to try for Friday, Saturday and Friday. Friday and Saturday. Should have flipped that. Uh, but that's where you get access to all that. Patreon.com slash UFNO podcast. Join the growing list of tinfoilists, the tinfoil militia, where you get no ads, all my loyalty. That sounded weird. All my loyalty. Uh, got a little pompous there. A little bit. A little, little pompous. It bougie. just came out of me. It was like a burp. <laughs> but all of a sudden, the class, he just showed up out of nowhere. Get off your pedestal. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I'm wearing these platform shoes, God damn it. Uh, you get the bonus good. episodes each and every single week. Uh, and I'm trying to do more, but so far it's one or two bonus episodes each week. Um, uh, uh, as well as the regular episodes. So two or three episodes per week on the Tinfoil Militia. And, of course, every episode is brought to you by the Tinfoil Militia members who support this podcast. Their names are these badasses, Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter Aaron Rice, Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavenis, Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, and, of course, our own wonderful Nathan Bodlegon Higby, who also supports the podcast, not just with his time and his talent, but also with his treasure. It's amazing. So fantastic. I love you guys. Thank you. you. Thank you. We love you back, dude. Uh, So anyway, so you too could be a part of that list, but these are the people who help support this show. It's because of them that we keep fucking doing this thing. And, uh, of course, I want to wish all those and all those listening 
all of my tinfoilists and everyone else a very happy Thanksgiving that's coming up. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. And I uh, hope you have a great weekend. I hope you get to go Black Friday shopping and get some good shit. Maybe a big ass TV, right? That's what Thanksgiving or Black Friday is all about. Big mm-hmm. ass TV. Make sure you all drink, drink safe. That's drive right. Safe. That's right. Find a driver. Yes, but also do something crazy. Maybe not kill anybody, but do something crazy. You know, maybe go uh, light a napkin on fire mm-hmm. somewhere. Put the turkey on your head. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things from friends you can take that are really fun if you do them in public. You know, that's yeah. what's great, putting the turkey on in public. That's fun. Fun. Do something. Just make, don't eat it. Make it weird, though. <laughs> make it weird. That's right. That's right. So, the Petra's, uh, uh, the Petra's Zavatsk jellyfish. That's what we're talking about, folks. Uh, and you might be wondering, like, what in the hell... Is he talking about jellyfish? What are we, marine biologists? <laughs> no. Uh, this <laughs> no. is this is a uh, phenomenon that we actually talked about this uh, in one of our bonus episodes. We talked about, or, yeah, I think it was bonus episodes. We talked about studying the um, squid sprites, I believe. Um, I'm going to try and bring it up real quick uh, while I'm thinking about it. Uh, but... The whole idea is that, uh, yeah, here we go, jellyfish sprites. Yeah, so we'll, uh, let me explain this to you. So if, for those of you that aren't familiar, and I do have links in the show notes, by the way. You can all check it out and follow along with the pictures. But uh, these jellyfish sprites are supposed to be, I brought up the wrong article actually uh i thought there was a wikipedia thing for him Son and, of a bitch. <laughs> anyway so what it is it's it's an atmospheric phenomenon that creates a squid like light in the sky and it's in response to what they found is from rocket launches it can show up it can show up from lightning they've seen them from space above the atmosphere um and nasa apparently wants to get in on this and study it as well, which is really, really interesting. But there's there are actually some real sightings that take place that where people wonder if this is a natural phenomena, is it a is it an alien? Is it secret technology? What is it? It seems organic in nature to a lot of people, but other cases seem mechanical. So we're going to break it down and kind of look at some of it and see see what it's all about. Um, so the story goes of the Petrozavatsk jellyfish, sighting specifically, that in the early hours one September morning in late 1970s, Soviet Union, during the Cold War, by the way, residents, I, and think about this time frame during the Cold War, how many rockets were going off? This is right oh, yeah. after World War II. This is right after Operation Paperclip. And so think about all the technology that I believe is being tested at this time period uh, without Mm -hmm. anybody's knowledge. They're not going to inform the public of this. Well, why would they? Why would they, exactly. Why would they? Yeah, I mean, even now they don't tell us shit. So why, why would they, why would they then? Shut up, enjoy your squid, mind your business. (laughs) That's right. So, during the Cold War, late 1970s, residents of a small... I mean, this is several, quite a ways after World War II. But, again, this is all during that time period where there's a mm-hmm. lot going on. I mean, MK Ultra is going on. You've got all kinds of... Uh, again, Operation Paperclip. You've got... There, there are so many things that have come to light from this time period of the 1940s even before 1930s to the 1970s, that is, it's, I, we could make an entire episode on that alone. So, anyways, there's a lot going on, a lot of secrecy going on, agencies being implemented, tons of shit going on. So, keep that all that in mind. But during this time, late 1970s, residents of a small Russian town saw a bizarre light moving overhead as they watched. The light morphed into a strange jellyfish-like object, projecting thousands of beams that looked like heavy rain, 
even leaving physical evidence. And despite several explanations by officials, UFO researchers still believe this one is a mystery. Uh, and we're going to solve it today on UFO No. Are you ready, kids? <laughs> <laughs> aye, aye, Captain. I can't hear you. Aye, aye, Captain. Jellyfish. Jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> and again, remember the time period. Cold War, mm-hmm. Nazi technology, scientists, crazy secret projects, all used in the U.S. All right. So, according to these reports, these sightings of the Petrovats jellyfish went on for 10 years. And the questions are, was it aliens or was it top secret technology being tested by its own government or potentially another government? So, the story goes that when residents first noticed this weird anomaly, it seemed to be descending in a spiral motion, similar to like a ball of fire. Then it reduced speed, which meant it wasn't a meteor. Eventually, it came to a complete stop, hovered directly over for a little over five minutes. And as it hovered, it made what they described a terrible noise, like the howling of a siren. Then this howling noise stopped and the object started to move again, heading towards the center of the town. Can you imagine if you saw a giant light anomaly like a ball of fire that came hovering over your town that all of a sudden let out a howling siren. That would be pretty scary. Yeah. That'd be pretty scary. That would remind me of like War of the Worlds. Do you ever see the one with uh, Tom Cruise? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was good. good. One. It was good. Yeah, he didn't bring any of his magic into that one, so it was actually good. But you know, when he gets all weird, and eh. but uh, it it was really good in that one, and and I loved the siren noise that the tripods made in that movie yeah. because it was creepy, and every mm-hmm. I could you know I put myself that moment where they're like coming over the mountains and or over the hills while everybody's in the water if you guys haven't seen that movie with Tom Cruise no matter how you feel about Tom Cruise go see Dude. that war of the worlds it's really 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 good they did a phenomenal job but the yeah. way they depict the aliens in that one and the beams of light coming down and hitting the people turning them to ash i was like damn that's good i like that and uh, anyways, really, really good. But that siren, dude, that was really, I in my head, I'm thinking, man, if I heard that sound and then I saw that thing, I'd be crapping my pants. Hell yeah. In a big way. So one of the d- descriptions of the object as it moved away was that it looked like a reddish orange hemisphere surrounded by a bright zone. Now, what is, what does that mean of a reddish orange hemisphere? Is that like hemisphere? It says half a, a sphere. Oh, okay. All right. I do, why not just say half circle? Why do you got to be all fancy about it? Because we're in three dimensions, man. It's not a two-dimensional thing. You're right. Yeah. You're, you're right. So inside this zone... There appeared to be, as they described, many points of light like stars that twinkled and disappeared. So the way I think of that is I'm thinking a half circle that potentially, is that a portal? Could be. Because if you, like, instead of it projecting those things, what if it's showing you those things? Like it, it's a gateway to, so instead of it being a creature... Could have been some kind of weird portal, like a time split or, I don't know, a a tear in the fabric of time. Shooting light rays? Well, this doesn't say it was shooting light rays. It says it was just traveling. 
It says it was a ball of fire that made the howling siren and that it was a half sphere surrounded by a bright zone that appeared to be inside the zone. There appeared to be many points of light like stars that twinkled oh. and disappeared. So that's, again, all inside, I'm thinking, yeah. portal. Like a gateway. Exactly. Yeah. So as it moved away from the initial group of witnesses, it started to pulsate slightly again, kind of like what you would think a, a portal might do if it was gearing up to shut down or open up or whatever. And then a beam of light shaped like a cone came from the underside of it. A moment later, a second beam came out and then both beams remained for several seconds before disappearing. Damn, so, that'd be scary as hell. It'd be very, very interesting. Especially mm -hmm. the sound, dude. If it did all that without any sound, I'd be like, not that scary. It'd be intriguing. But that sound, the howling of a siren, like a mm -hmm. weird talking, siren. Yeah. We're talking 1977, too. So, I mean, we're nowhere near as advanced as no. we are now. No, man. Well... Well, definitely not nearly as advanced as we are now, but we just don't even know what kind of technology they had then. Exactly. Yeah. But as far as public was, yeah. we're Nowhere a few near. steps behind where we are now. Yep, yep. As more and more people started to notice this thing, multiple thin rays of light described as thin arrows came down from the sky. Seconds later, a surge of panic spread through the onlookers who until that point were fascinated, not scared, but then they were scared. A lot of people ran back inside, take cover, uh, because they thought they were under attack. <coughs> Pardon me. Others threw themselves to the ground. Some thought it was a nuclear attack by the Americans. Interesting, right? We never hear that side of it, you know, from a There's Russian perspective. Yeah, exactly. Because it's always, you know, I always hear stories of Americans mm -hmm. that during that time were doing the, you know, the the nuclear drills in the in the schools and shit. Well, whenever we ever got into war, we well, were the villains. <laughs> yeah. When when here's a question: When has anybody gone to war where they're the villains? Exactly. Anyone. Nobody does. Nobody. Everybody thinks they're doing right. Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing. That's why the term history is written by the victors comes to light. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, but the more the people watched this thing, the more it started to take on the appearance of a huge jellyfish around 300 feet across with golden tentacles that shone in many beautiful colors. See, the thing that creeps me out about this part mm. is that this reminds me kind of like a cryptid. Mm. And then I start thinking about the episode we did about Susan who got to watch everyone get mutilated. Yeah. And then I think about her poor aunt who got tentacle fucked. Yeah. <laughs> and now we got the mothership of that. Oh, <laughs> the mothership of the tentacle fucker. Mm -hmm. That's scary, man. Yeah. Good point. So far, these tentacles just seem to be light rays. But That's good. Who knows, man? Who knows? That's just foreplay. <laughs> That's right. Let me shine this light in you. See how you like that. Does this turn you on, my light? I'd like to see you cry first. <laughs> <laughs> and also, these strange beams of light had a curve to them, much like the tentacles of a jellyfish or an octopus, similar to what you just said. That's amazing because, you know, light doesn't bend. Yeah, exactly. What is also interesting, at least according to the reports by the uh, journalist Nikolai Milov, was that a lot of people appeared to be sick after the incident for hours after. Some of them who ended up talking to me, love, claimed they could feel some kind of electric current run through their body when the arrow-like lights 
appeared. Which would make sense. I mean, if it's if it's energy that's producing that, which in my opinion, what, if it's not mechanical, it has to be energy based. That's what comes to my mind too. Then if you know, obviously we are electrical, you know, little nodes. Mm-hmm. So if it's a powerful enough electrical current, then it's it could easily go through people. Easily pass through. What a weird feeling that would be. Imagine that. Imagine the feeling of an alien electrical current going through you. You would hope, I, I at least for me, I would hope that it, it did at least one of two things. <clears throat> one, it either has the John Travolta phenomenon effect, which it makes me totally smart and a genius. <laughs> or it just makes my dick bigger. Either I'll take either one. I'll take wow. either one. Doctors are just like, sir, I don't know what happened. It looks to be mm-hmm. that the electrical current has somehow expanded your cock. And I'll be like, God damn. It's great news. It's a rather specific mutation, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, here's the hope. Here's the hope. <laughs> no more jokes now. That's right. That's right. No more tiny penis jokes, you cocks. <laughs> the other weird thing about this is that when or where these lights touch the ground and sometimes on windowsills, get this, they left Holes the size of a coin. So these would be like con- like focused, focused. like almost like a like a, a laser beam. Yes. Wow. Now think about light that now can be can can have can take form, take shape. Focused. Focused light. Focused light. Focus like light. lightsaber. Yes, exactly. Yes. What if, what I if aliens are light energy beings that have learned similar to like lightsabers to harness light? And it doesn't matter where they go, right? Because there's energy everywhere. So mm-hmm. if that, I mean, think about an alien species that truly wants to, to, live forever, go anywhere, pass through any time, and you name it, what's the best way to do that? Become completely energy fluid to the point where, because there's energy everywhere, it doesn't matter what planet you go to, doesn't matter what part of the cosmos you go to, does not matter what time period you go to, there is energy everywhere. To me, that is, is a truly advanced civilization is one that has realized that, well, enter everything is energy. If we are energy, then we can go anywhere and be anywhere and be anything. Solid. Solid. Awesome. Solid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So anyway, so you got these coin like holes, wherever this concentrated point of light and, and and the other thing is the fact that, as you said, it can bend. Light doesn't bend. It mm-hmm. takes shape. It has, like, the tentacles. Clearly, it's not just tentacles going an infinite amount of distance. You know, it has a, a specific length to it. So it's control. It has to be controlled light. And, and also, it could very easily be holographic technology that is powerful enough to leave residual markers. You know, like, uh, did you ever see Spider-Man? Uh, what, what's the uh, homecoming? Is that what it was? You know, you're probably going to hate me for saying this. It's okay. But I never uh, watched any of the Tom Holland Spider-Man. Oh, that's okay. Uh, yeah. Well, e- either way, in it, there's a <laughs> character called Mysterio. And oh, I know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his whole thing, at least in the movie, was he projects holograms with high grade military drones that also have weapon capability so he can damage things 
in this holographic imagery. And so if there's a way to be able to just, like, we know they're super powerful lasers. Super powerful. And that's just what's, I mean, look, you can go on fucking Wish and buy a goddamn powerful laser. You're telling me the military doesn't have access to, like, high-grade space-time lasers? And you go to Wish or a laser, they send you a flashlight. Yeah, a flashlight. <laughs> a flashlight. <laughs> I said flashlight, but yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> well, I know. I know you said flashlight. I said flashlight. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so I just think like it could be multiple things. Uh, but the closer they got, the you know, all the witnesses got to this thing, the brighter it got. Mm-hmm. Uh, and was now so bright that a lot of the witnesses had to shield their eyes from it. It was It was getting that bright. And a lot of the residents saw a bulb-shaped object detach itself from the main craft and fly over rooftops and houses almost like it was surveying the area like a reconnaissance mission. So these people are walking towards the jellyfish? I think the jellyfish is coming towards them. And they're all standing there like idiots. Is what I'm gathering. Yeah. yeah. You know, from well, what I mean, they said is, before, some people took cover, some people ran, some people yeah. stayed. Um, so I think the the onlookers that stayed are the ones that are, are, you know, conveying this. And so they say that it continued to do this for several minutes before then returning to the main craft. And some witnesses claim that it disappeared into an opening on the underside suggesting some kind of remote-controlled drone. Now, here's what makes me think. Why would a super-advanced alien civilization that can control light have a mechanical drone when they could just have a separation of energy that goes out and then comes back? Nothing would even have to open or close. It would simply just meld and come back. You know, energy into energy, just pop out a little bit of energy, has its own signature, goes out, scans, comes back. All the all the data it collected just morphs in with the main object. It could be physical beings that harness energy for travel. Could be. Or could be. it could be a craft that projects a holographic image. Mm-hmm. So remember what they saw in the beginning. Right? It was a simple fire ball of fire, ball of light that made a sireny noise, all very mechanical so far. The the hemisphere, the half circle, all shaped, almost looking like a portal. But think about this. It could have been points of light being lights that are getting ready to project. So you've got a ball of light that is, imagine a disco ball, but it, all those little mirrors are projectors. And what they're seeing is before the thing is started projecting an image, they're just seeing the residual light of the, of the mechanism sitting there. And then when these beams start coming out, that's when all of a sudden you got thin rays shooting out. What is it doing? It's probably scanning the area seeing how much room it's got, like any, like uh, we play the Oculus all the time. And every time you turn it on, you got to do a, a configuration of getting your, where it's going and all that shit. Could very easily be orientating itself, getting a, shooting a beam down to read how far away am I from the ground, ba 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 picking up the, the environment. And then boop, it just creates into... As it gets closer, why wasn't it a jellyfish before? It was just a ball of light with several points of light like stars. Think about like a, you know what I'm talking about? Like a projector ball that would have all these little tiny cameras in it shooting these little individual lasers. But it's not shooting Mm -hmm. the lasers yet. It's just lights and it's hovering there. But then all of a sudden it starts projecting the light and now it's taking shape. That light starts to take shape. 
And for a projection that size, it would take a while to warm up any kind of machinery to do that. There you go. And it's moving the whole time. And then, of course, it's got this little drone thing that comes out. So I'm thinking it could very easily be if this is the, you know, the the aspect of that, it, it was not a weird cryptid jellyfish thing at first. It was just a ball of light that morphed into this as it got closer to them. So I think we have to leave open the idea that this could have been, even in the 70s, even in the 70s, could have been a highly advanced form of holographic drone. Mm-hmm. MK Ultra. Well, I mean, you wouldn't even need MK Ultra. I mean, in this case, you have a physical object creating a holographic image. You don't even need mind manipulation. Or no. at least internal. Sorry, I should have Project Bluebeam. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, my bad. Long week. <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, I get what you're saying. Yeah, because it's all. But yeah, MK Ultra is the mind manipulation internal. Project Bluebeam is yeah. the overall agenda of using technology to stage multiple false flags, including, mm-hmm. if not for the sole purpose of creating a staged false alien invasion. But, um, so again, I think that you have to leave that open. Now, of course, you know, they're taking it from the alien or physical phenomena. Uh, you know, as we did say in the beginning, potentially, uh, secret technology, but we don't know. I mean, again, I think based on what I've seen with computer graphic design in movies, how good things look. The amount of technology you see out there where it's all holographic, what they're doing with like meta surfaces and all this. I mean, dude, that's whatever we got. They got better. A thousand percent. There was a, there was a, a thing on Facebook today. I was looking at, you know, I follow all these like alien groups and one of them was like, it's confirmed Uh, somebody came forward saying that no government has the type of technology that anti-gravity technology, no government. Uh, so it has to be alien. And so I threw in there the Ben rich quote of where, you know, there's things in the desert that are 50 years beyond what the public knows. Uh, you know, and the whole thing of Star Wars and Star Trek, that if it's, it, you know, if it was in that, those, we, we've been there and done that. Mm-hmm. You know, that there's no possible way anyone could know. There's no possible way. So, no, that's a, a, a you know, I'll never believe. I, I don't think I will ever believe 100% that everything over us that, is alien or whatever that we think is, is not government. So, you know, even this again, as, as crazy as it seems with it being a space squid, you know, you could, in my opinion, you could easily have some type of holographic projecting drone out there that just projects an image around itself. I just don't see why that's that difficult. They can do that now. You can literally hold in your hand a little puck that puts out a projection uh, like they had in, in Star Wars and shit. We have things like that. Didn't we do a real-life hologram at an NFL game a while back? Uh, maybe, maybe NFL. I don't know about NFL, but they've done straight-up holograms of Tupac. Mm-hmm. They've done straight up holograms. I mean, some of the stuff coming out of China and Japan uh, of like drone demonstrations is unbelievable. Yeah. And then you add in like, like we were talking about one of the bonus episodes about them wanting to advertise with drones, putting up straight up advertisements of with drones in the sky that now advertisers can buy sky space and advertise in the sky using drones. I mean, that's a terrible term. It's a terrible idea. It's a horrible, space. horrible. Yeah. 
how the fuck do you buy sky space dude they're Who wanting the to do it was sky? like over seattle or some shit they wanted to do I this believe it. and it was for That's starbucks stupid. dude for starbucks that fucking place sucks <laughs> So yeah, it's ridiculous. But there's no, there's no. If we can do that, there is no end to what they can do. Come on, guys. Come on. There's no end. To, there's no possible way we could know. You're talking fifty years of technology in the future. Fifty, even thirty years, even thirty years, which has been some of the some of the lower estimates of how far ahead they are as far as behind closed doors with uh, these defense contractors and private companies. Well, Black let's look budget at a base projects. fact here. Let's look at a base fact. The government does not want you, any government does not want their people to be at the same level as them. That's right. What, what good does it do them? What Where's, good does it do a government, any government for, for you to know exactly what they know? What, what good is it? I mean, they look the term national security is one of the biggest general terms thrown on anything they want to cover up. Oh, it's uh in in the the it's uh, the benefit of national security. Can't let it go. Mm-hmm. I mean, the amount of technology that has been Tesla is a great example of that. Nikola Tesla had his when he died, he had all of his research stolen. Mm-hmm. Why? For national security. The guy that made a a water motor, a motor that ran off of water, gone. National security. They scoop up all that shit. That's why you know that Elon Musk has to be a government agent. You have to. There's no, there's no, there is no billionaire that is not connected to a government. Guaranteed. They wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't allow it. You want it in the billionaires club? Well, then you're in politics. Mm-hmm. That's all there is to it. It's too small of a group. Even if you're not openly in it, you're feeding it. Absolutely. Yeah, you might not have to go all political on certain things, but you're in it. I mean, look, let's you're let's right be straight track. up here with, with Elon Musk. And I'm taking a real weird turn here, but just let's think about this. Despite whatever happened before Tesla, Tesla itself, which I would argue is what really, you know, brought him into the forefront of where he is today. Uh, despite the the whole path, Tesla is what really, really broke him into all the rest. Without government subsidies, Tesla would not have, have made it. And mm-hmm. without Tesla, there would be no SpaceX. And without SpaceX, look, look what you have. You have spa- a privatized uh, uh, space exploration, I guess. So it's all government funding. You can't even be there without being in the government's pocket or the government being in your pocket. No way. Mm-hmm. No way. So anyways. Again, I think... Right now, I'm still convinced it could be some kind of drone. But following all this, according to statements given by uh, Director of Meteorological Station of Petrozavodsk, Yuri Gromov, the object gradually assumed the shape of an elliptical ring. So now it's changing shapes again. And then it started moving again, heading directly into some nearby clouds over Onesco Lake. And as yeah, it went me, into... What's that? I'm sorry. No, go I'm ahead. sorry to interrupt you, buddy. See, to me, turning into the ring kind of would make... It makes a lot of sense. It would be an important step because it's going to start traveling and putting energy towards motion. It would want to reduce the amount of energy it's putting out for a projection. What better way to just do a simple fucking bright ring yeah. and move? Yep. Good point. Good point. Now, here's an interesting aspect. As it went into the clouds, here's what's very weird. According to these reports, okay, think about what clouds are made of before I read this. 
as it went into the clouds, it left behind a red hole as if the clouds had been burned. I'll read that again. It went into the clouds, leaving behind a red hole as if the clouds were burned. Now, what are clouds made of? It's water vapor, right? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were actually asking me. Yeah, it's just water vapor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, just in general. I'm just asking in general. Yeah. But yeah, water vapor. Have you have you ever seen red hot water vapor? Red hot? I've never seen any color of water unless you made it that color. Because can't it can't go red hot. Red hot would mean it's sustained heat, right? To get red hot means it would have to increase in temperature. The moment you touch water vapor that's already in cloud form, it's already in vapor form, with any form of heat, what's it going to do? It's going to go poof. It's not going to leave a red hole in it as though you burn through a piece of paper. What? What? How could you leave burned water vapor? That's not, is that a thing? I'm legitimately curious. If there's some person out there that's listening to this that is going, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know about burnt clouds. Then please, please let me know because I dug into this. (laughs) All right. I looked into this and I'm not a smart man. I'm not a smart man, Jenny. But I know what clouds is. And you can't fucking burn clouds like that. You can't. It Red hot. It, a red hole as if the clouds have been burned. Think about that. Like smoldering clouds. Am I, am I totally off my rocker here, Nate? Am I missing something? Yeah. This one really bothered me. Well, I hear in Russia that they prefer their clouds out of paper because it's a little more environment. It provides more shade on the sunny days than a typical cloud. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that could have been the case. You know what? I stand corrected. I stand corrected. Their paper clouds perhaps may have sustained a burn. Mm -hmm. I stand corrected. All right, so assuming Russia has paper clouds. All right. All right. I look, I will take that for now because otherwise it's going to eat me up inside because that one really bothered me. Uh cuz water if it's true if it's not Russian paper clouds, it's actual <laughs> water vapor clouds uh like, you know, over everywhere else, then you can't do that. I mean, think about how hot a jet engine is, right? A jet engine. How many times does a plane fly through clouds? Now, typically, they try and go over them, around them, whatever, but it happens. I'm sure a pilot somewhere at some point would have been like, oh, look at that. I burned that cloud. Right? (laughs) Right? Right? So, no, I don't understand that at all. So, So that right there, the elliptical ring thing and, and leaving behind a red hole... Nate, your reason makes more sense than theirs. That Russia hangs paper clouds, and that's what it was burned from, than this thing burning through water vapor. Really helps the sun and this global warming get that extra shade, like I said. You know. They're really onto something. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, like I said, I stand corrected. But still, I want to know about that. Can you burn water vapor? All right, moving on. Later investigations show that there were no aircraft over the town at the time that this thing was moving around. So this uh, Yuri Gromov, who was the meteorologist, dismissed the idea that it could be ball lightning or any other atmospheric phenomena, including apparently burnt clouds. But see, he's saying it's burnt clouds. (sighs) Anyways. Gromov said it was either a UFO, 
the messenger of a higher intelligence with crew and passengers or a field of energy that came from a UFO. So he's not even entertaining the idea it's anything but a UFO or some kind of energy that came from a UFO. Not they even entertaining the idea. Everything's aliens. Well, that's a lot of the problem is that people want it to be alien. They see something they don't recognize. I mean, look, I use this example a lot and not, you know, I say not to poke on religion, but I'm about to poke on religion. So here we go. But a Uh lot of these times, these stories in, you know, in the Bible uh, about the finger of God coming down and, and grabbing Elijah or Ezekiel or whatever his name was. Uh, the Red Sea, all these types of things, a lot of times are attributed to natural phenomena that was just very sudden and very great that may have been exaggerated a little bit, and also these people were superstitious. Exaggerated? Maybe a little bit. Nuh-uh. Maybe. Nuh-uh. Maybe. Mm-mm. Maybe. A little bit. In certain little cases. Bit. In certain cases. Just through a few chapters. Just say <laughs> that's right. So it same idea. People that want to believe in UFOs will see UFOs. Am I right? Of course. People that believe in angels will see angels. People that believe in ghosts will see ghosts. And I'm not saying these things don't exist. I just think it's not always what we label them as. And in this case, the UFO phenomena specifically is full of fuckery. And so to me, it's very, very arrogant for people to say one way or the other what it is. So that's why I like to just highlight all the different things it could be. And so far, I'm still not sold on anything that it wasn't a drone. I still think all of this stuff could still be a drone. I'm still pretty firm in the belief that aliens do come to Earth, but they whatever we've ever captured or recovered was never alien. Yeah. Alien, like there's no fucking way. No way. Aliens do pass through our atmosphere, probably through our planet, at least in orbit. I think you know, a lot like of a things stop. do. I think a lot of things do. Yeah. It's like a truck stop. They're That's just right. passing by. That's right. You know, but everything that, but it makes it even more difficult because whatever we recover, we're so quick to jump on it that it eliminates the possibility of us actually discovering the truth because everyone's just throwing out their own stories and jumping on some bandwagon that's going big or it just pisses me off. God damn it. I want a goddamn alien. Yeah, me too. But I want it to be authentic. authentic. I want it to be real. I want it to be. And, mm-hmm. and now we're at a point. It. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to put his dick in me. I'm to a point where I, even if uh, an alien landed, an alien craft landed right in front of me, I don't know what I would believe. I don't know what I would believe. I'm so torn on, you know, we're, we're encroaching a point of technology where even our own technology is hard to imagine sometimes. You know, some of these things, I mean, like when we talk about AI, it's, you know, we, we talk about AI like we know what we're talking about. It, we barely have a grasp on that. You know, quantum technology is, a, we barely have a grasp on that, on these concepts. I don't want none of it. It's freaky. Yeah. And now we're talking about an alien civilization, potentially, that has a grasp on all of those things. Not only do they have a grasp, they can utilize them. And I mean, Jesus, it's, it's like the first mm-hmm. time you step in front of the ocean and you realize how big it is. Such it, an amazing feeling. It is. And, and it dwarfs you. It's humbling. It's, it's, and, and imagine that, but on a, on a species level, you know, that's hard to, that's hard to fathom. So, but, but again, I just don't know what I would believe because I'm so convinced that uh, that they, they're you know, there are technologies capable of replicating almost anything in real life. If anything, I think aliens that pass by kind of look at us like a fucking sitcom. Like, hey, let's watch these guys for a while. This is funny as hell. They lock their doors and roll up their windows. 
Yeah, it was like the doors were open, the windows just passed by. Yeah, yep. It's our failed attempts to do what they're doing is what we're seeing. Well, it's like uh, it's like when we watched, you know, as a, as humans, we would watch these terrible reality shows like Big Brother and shit, and it was like morbid curiosity because you just wanted to see people, the worst of people, in a way. And uh, so it it could be that. See, that's why I never got into the reality shows because if I wanted to see that, I could just go outside. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, for me, it was just like, I mean, when it, when all that stuff first came out, you know, Survivor first came out, all these reality shows first started really coming out. I mean, it, it was intriguing at first because there wasn't anything oh, like it sure. before that. But then yeah, after, when Survivor first came out, I was a little guy. Yeah, I was totally into that. But after a while, it kind of got repetitive. Well, not only that, it just got very, very fake. You know, mm-hmm. you could you could really tell that it was just highly produced. And the other thing was it was like the areas they were going to survive, people lived there. You know, like be, people there were there were tribes there. In fact, one of the rewards was to go into a village where a tribe lived full time. And it was a reward for them to like go over there and eat bugs, you know. It's like it's just it's just uh it's it's very interesting. It's so fake, you know. Reality TV. What is what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I fell off long before Big Brother or any of that crap. Yeah, yeah, it, it really went down the toilet. <laughs> but again, that's you know, it could be one of those things where they just want to they just want to watch the madness. But after this sighting. The news agency, uh, the local news agency, got over 1,500 letters from concerned citizens asking about potential radiation levels. And uh, further investigation showed that a lot of these reports weren't put in the news. They weren't broadcasted. They weren't talked about. Um mostly because it seemed like government officials had forbid the news stations from reporting on it. And, um, yeah, anyways, there was no mention of anything that happened that night in the news. Now, there's rumors that behind closed doors, of course, scientists were looking at the incident, trying to figure it all out. Uh, And eventually, that news leaked to the public, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union. Kind of a lot of things came out. One of the journalists who had some good government sources for a lot of years, including at the time that this all happened, Vasil Zakharchenko claimed the holes caused by the tentacles melted the glass as well as left the the coin size uh, holes. And according to a lecture given by Dr. Azaza in late 1981, it wasn't just the glass that showed signs of melting. There was significant distortion to the windows themselves, as in the window frames. And when this glass was inspected under electron microscope, they found a crystalline structure on the surface of the non-crystalline glass, which meant, now I don't know what this means, but according to scientists, that's impossible. Mm. Mm, Indeed. And I tried to look it up, but it was all a lot of big words that I didn't understand. I could understand glass, but the rest of it was beyond me. Yeah, we are not smart people. No. No. Baseline. Baseline. That's what we like to do. We like to, that's why it's everything in here. Layman terms, man. That's why we break it down. Real life. We may not have a lot of intelligence, but we have a lot of common sense. That's right. Common sense and uh, positivity. Mm-hmm. That's right. We're positive we're going to get to the bottom of it. Positive so, I'm going to get a turkey leg. <laughs> Damn straight. Thanksgiving. 
Uh, according to her other reports, samples of the glass were analyzed by scientists and other interested people. And one of the first people to do this was Dr. Dale Krushank, uh, who confirmed that the presence of crystalline around the edge of the holes was indeed weird. And, of course, uh, there was another guy, Professor Manfred Cage, of the Institute for Scientific Photography said the same thing. And then there was another study done by the president of the Academy of Sciences. But they said, according to them, that the holes caused by the light beams were not caused by the light beams, were caused by still unknown natural atmospheric phenomenon possibly in connection with human technology, for instance, a rocket launch. Nice. So, that is very interesting. That, again, you have people that want to believe it's aliens. So, what's the conclusion they come up with? Aliens. But you give it to some people that don't really give a fuck, one way or the other. And they say, well, it looks like it could have been formed by human technology. And in this case, again, as I pointed out, it could be. Could be. Now, they say a rocket launch. I don't know how a rocket launch is going to leave coin size marks on windowsills of farmhouses and shit. I mean, because in order for it to do that, I would think it would have to be in a radius that the people would no doubt have known a rocket launched. I would think. Because I don't, it, I'm, I'm seriously doubting that a rocket launch from, you know, let's say 50 miles away, where then you might not realize it, maybe, uh, is going to cause any kind of weird phenomenon that far away. You know what I mean? So how far away are these people from any rocket launch that happened? Well, well. We are talking about Russia. That's right. Well, here's the interesting thing. There's a lot of researchers that rejected the idea that this was the result of a rocket launch. But, oh, well, here's the phenomenon of, first of all, why these things, how these things, rocket launches, would even cause something like this. The reason why is the way that they describe it is that sunlight reflects from the rocket plumes at a high altitude and that there's actually a lot of UFO sightings over the years that have been the result of rocket launches. People will see some weird shit in the atmosphere due to the light refraction, all that. And interestingly... There was a rocket launch that morning at 4.03 a.m., two minutes, two minutes before the sighting. But it was 200 miles away. And get this, it launched a spy satellite, the Cosmos 955. So could it have been that it launched something, but then maybe during that time they launched something else or the rocket actually went into space and then dropped this thing down or I don't know. Or was it really refracted light from the, from the rocket plume? But some things that it doesn't explain as far as it being a ro- from the rocket. It doesn't explain why the object appeared to get larger and even to come closer before hovering in place. It also doesn't explain the tentacle light light beams that multiple people saw. It also doesn't explain the holes, the melted glass, the window frames. So the guy that was put in charge of overseeing the investigation for the university, where was it? It was the, 
Uh, oh, Academy of Sciences. The guy that was put in, in charge of this, of overseeing this investigation, he even said that he believed that the strange sighting was not what the Academy of Sciences said that was from a rocket. In an interview later, he had said that there was insufficient investigation of the incident by the Academy of Sciences. This uh, this investigation guy, Petra Zavotsk, or I'm sorry, his name is W. Migulin. Uh, Migulin said that some of the weird findings that they had managed to put together was a route that the object took. It had gone further than most people realized. According to the official records, between 3.06 a.m. and 3.10 a.m., a bright ball of fire was seen by police officers in Helsinki, the capital of Finland. Remember, this is taking place in Russia. So Finland and the glowing orb hovered over the airport for just under five minutes before heading east. Around 20 minutes later, another witness, Nema Yavo, which is around 20 miles, or I'm sorry, in Nema Yavo, which is 20 miles northwest of Petrozavosk, saw the object through his telescope. He said it was lens-shaped and appeared to shine a violet color. And he also said it appeared to be surrounded by a shining ring. And that this ring had bright pulses of rays of light coming from it. Like tentacles of a jellyfish. Two minutes after that, around 3.30 a.m., several fishermen on uh, Onazesco Lake reported a bright light. They said the object was unlike anything they'd ever seen. Surrounded by a strange haze. And then 4 a.m., several employees of an observatory saw a ball of fire move across the sky at the same time. A pilot flying a passenger plane from Kiev to Leningrad also saw a strange object. As the uh, object disappeared out of sight from Petrozavodsk, many people saw it moving across the sky, several in Polovina, seeing the clouds suddenly light up, which these are all towns around the area. As if a light was traveling through the clouds, making them glow from the inside. Then there's also the weird aspect of the feelings that people reported of an electrical current passing through them after they saw the light beams hit the ground. That definitely is not a typical report of a rocket launch, (laughs) for sure. No, I've heard of rockets uh, doing a lot of shit, but light beams, not once. Yeah. And of course, if it is just a holographic image... Why is it leaving marks? There's also that. I'd be a lot of a uh, lot of light, a lot of power to use to make a projection that size. So and I'd that, imagine it would have some sort of heat to it, but I don't know. That's that's pretty nuts. Uh, bending light beams. But that's again, if you look at a lot of the lasers that are out now, mm-hmm. they got lasers that you know, can are can absolutely burn shit. I mean, maybe not the size of a coin, but again, these are just shit you can buy. I mean you can buy. You know, these are these are lasers that are easy to get a hold of. But of course, there are other sightings of jellyfish shaped UFOs over time, all over the world. Some could be from rockets, as we said. Some of them do turn out to be that way. But some 
are a little bit harder to dismiss that way. So we'll go over some of those. In 2015, a Dutch photographer, Harry Purton, captured what appeared to be a green jellyfish-shaped UFO while taking pictures of the sunset. He, did, he realized he'd taken a picture of something weird. He thought it wasn't much other than a bolt of lightning until he went and looked at the pictures closer and he realized he caught something potentially otherworldly. Oh. But even him, despite UFO researchers and enthusiasts, Believing it was alien, Purton, the guy who took the pictures, doesn't Mm. believe it was an alien. He thinks it was something more grounded in science. He doesn't say what it is that he thinks he is. It is, but he sounds like he's realistic. So of course he's like, I don't know what the fuck that is. Yeah. And again, I think it's I, I think it's an interesting look into psychology of people that automatically jump to that conclusion. You know, they clearly want it to be that way. Clearly. And sometimes it's, uh, it's just a matter of looking into the history of any, of any history. And you can see how history has progressed to this point to where the government is going to be in power. Yeah. They are going to be further ahead of you because that is control. That's government. That's how it sustains its power. Yep. And technology is could potentially fuel that power. You mm-hmm. know, it could make gaining that power easier. It could make you know, obviously technology has helped spread propaganda. Oh, yeah. Technology has been used against day. people. People, I mean, look at weapons. Weapons is a good example of technology. I'm not against guns in any way, but Love c- them. certainly you could honestly say that, you know, the military is far more advanced than you or I are. Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. My little pew pew we ain't gonna do shit what they got. No. <laughs> yeah, what did Biden say that uh, the American people would need an F sixteen to fight the government? I got yeah, one. I don't think that's enough. Yeah, I got one in the mail. Yeah. I got it's well, it's Tom one of those Cruise you gotta assemble it yourself. Him. It's one of those you have to assemble it yourself, but I got it coming. I got it coming. I feel like Tom Cruise owes the world. He can let us use his jets. <laughs> yeah, no shit. There he is. That's the second time Cruz has popped up in our episode. Crazy. He's the only civilian I can think of that's got spider jets. Yeah, good point. So another sighting of this happened in Scotland on New Year's New Year's Day, two thousand two. A huge white ball that glowed and looked like a flying jellyfish was seen. In fact, between 2002 and 2006, there were several of these sightings reported in Scotland, including sightings of golden spheres in 2006 seen by several residents. You know, and and again, I'm going to point out the fact that, you know, you can say, well, a huge ball of, of glowing light might not be technology. It might be alien. But it might be human technology. The lights, lights, that's not hard. Like LED lights these days, my God, the things you can do with light is insane. So, you know, that we even in this, you know, 2002, 2006, again, what we're seeing now, if you take what, what Ben Rich says, 50 years then in 1970, technically, they had what we have now. And what we have now is incredible, powerful light. Mm-hmm. So if they were using all this back then, when we it wasn't a known thing, then it would appear to be alien. It would appear to be some kind of advanced craft. But instead, 
It could just be advanced government technology. Mm -hmm. Now, these other sightings, they weren't reports of tentacles or jellyfish shapes. But on February 19th, 94, over Craig Luscar Reservoir, Ian McPherson was looking away from the water when he noticed a humming sound like high-voltage power lines. Again, very man-made type stuff. High-voltage power lines humming. Advanced technology, I wouldn't think would hum. I mean, a lot of times they're silent. Yeah. As he turned around, he saw a disc-like object heading in his direction that he claimed was the size of a jumbo jet with a metallic exterior. He could also see several lights on the object's underside. And despite hearing the humming sound, McPherson claimed the object had no other sound whatsoever. Well, if it was loud enough, you wouldn't hear any other sound. And he had his camera with him, but wouldn't you know it, by the time he came to his senses... The object was gone. Dag nabbit, wouldn't you know it? Some bitch. <laughs> Every time. Every time. I'm going to get me a little more coffee just one second. Do I it. apologize. No worries. So, a little bit of that bean water. Yeah, good old bean water. Also, in uh, 2012, a British satellite expert and government advisor, Dr. Maggie Adderin Pacock, Pacock, claimed that <laughs> <laughs> claimed that aliens could look something like jellyfish. And could be the size of a football field. Or the size of a football if you ask at Susan's aunt. That's right. Oh, you can't. <laughs> she claims that, that she she bases this on how intelligent alien life might evolve somewhere like Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. And one of the places in our solar system where scientists suggest one day could be colonized and might already contain life. And again, my biggest thing is it's only human of us to assume that alien life would be humanoid. Yes. Yeah, well, and the other thing is, why would it be so big? Mm -hmm. Why would it be the, why would it look like a jellyfish? Specifically a jellyfish. An earth creature. Well, yeah. there's a lot of things about, about jellyfish yes. that's weird. So maybe yeah. they, maybe they really are aliens, but now we've got some, some of these that fell down to earth. I mean, who knows? Weird. Well, there is a theory that earth is just a Petri dish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But the hole could be the size of a football field. I don't understand. Like, obviously, things are going to have their own size and shape. Yeah. But it's always the size of a football field. Do you notice that? It's always the size. Every time. Every time you hear somebody describe something as big, what do they say? Oh, man, it's about the size of a football field. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that? So it's such a specific size. I just don't get it. But she suggests that these jellyfish-like aliens could drift through methane clouds of planets like Titan or Saturn taking chemical nutrients from the air, drawing energy from the light, similar to photosynthesis. And they could also, like you had just pointed out, be based on silicone as opposed to carbon. Exactly. 
And she also says that these aliens could communicate using pulses of light. Now, the question I have is, where is she, where is she getting all this? Is she, just, is she just saying, well, they could do, they could be this, they could be that? The problem is, is when people, you know, she's a satellite expert. A satellite expert and government advisor. Instant trust right there. Instant trust. And that that's what I mean. It's like, is she an expert on what alien civilizations and species could be? Oh, that's just Jim. He's passing through. He does it all the time. <laughs> that's right. She goes on to say that she believes... Because we know uh, about strange life forms, you know, creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean, the the most inhospitable depths of the ocean, that there are there life there. And she believes that, as she says, conventional wisdom, or I'm sorry, she says our imaginations are naturally constrained by what we see around us. That conventional wisdom has been that life needs water and is carbon based. Just, now, what she says is just be uh, silicon is just below carbon in the periodic table. Silicon's everywhere. That's easy. Exactly. She goes on to say it's widely available in the universe. Now, you can go all the way with this. You can go all the way, say, okay, well, yeah, they, I mean, if they if they could be silicone-based, they could be, like I said, light, light-based, energy-based, anything. Mm-hmm. Literally, anything that you find in abundance in the universe, life can be formed out of it. It makes sense. And then all you need at that point is a civilization that can now travel, exist in space, and travel through space. And then there's a potential of us meeting them. Could it be? Could it be that the Petrozavodsk jellyfish, these other sightings, could it be these type of alien creatures that aren't? Carbon based that may be light based. That maybe it's creatures themselves as opposed to vehicles, or maybe it's the vehicles. Or maybe it's your shysty government. Or maybe it's your shysty government. Hmm. There's a lot of speculation in all of UFO research. And that's all it ever can be. That's all it ever can be. never any proof. That's the same with theology. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's very, very similar when you look at it. It is faith-based, belief-based, with some literature to back it up that gives you no facts, just reasons to solidify your belief. Mm-hmm. It is, in all intents and purposes, a religion. It's a belief in something, someone greater than yourself. For simple blind faith. I mean, and they can say, it's not blind. I got text or I got literature right here that tells me it's so. I, I could talk to every Christian in the world that will tell me the exact same thing. In fact, they'll take me to a passage that backs up exactly what they're saying. You go talk to a ufologist, what are they going to do? They're going to point to a memo written back in the 40s that backs up what they're saying. It's mm-hmm. very much so a religion. As I say all the time, I want to believe. 
Yeah, so bad. So bad. So bad. I want to believe that there is, I mean, you know, I obviously I don't want to believe in the, the bad alien premise, but if there's aliens, you know there's bad ones. Of course. That's Can't just, have good without bad. Of course. Of course. As you pointed out, Nate, and as we've pointed out numerous times, we are human-centric. Everything we do, everything we think, we imagine is is thought out of the idea of us. And as you again, you pointed out that that's why everything is per, per, uh, you know, um, not predicted. Humanoid. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say yeah. not predicted. It's uh, what's the word? Damn it! I had it too. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a week. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with it. But that's why everything is made out to be humanoid. Yeah. Alien. Uh even if it's as alien like like take take the alien movies. The the uh uh what what's the term for them? Xeno something? Uh xenomorphs. There you go. I love them guys. The humanoid. Very mm-hmm. much so. Head, arms, legs. Shoulders, knees, and toes. There you go. Everything, mm-hmm. everything. I mean, you know, so my belief, and I've never done this, I want to desperately, but based on what I've read about and, and listened to, and trust me when I say I've done deep dives into this, into DMT and psychedelic experiences, I am convinced more and more when I hear these testimonies that that is where aliens reside is through these compounds, these substances Mm -hmm. that you have to be teleported to a different place to see them, to experience them, to get on their realm. And even then the majority of people that go there, even people that are familiar with it, it's, it's like trying to see a color you've never seen before. That's right. It's so far out of your perception of reality, outside of your your mm-hmm. senses, that you come back. They come back, like coming back, feeling as though they've come back with an answer, a message, something that that changes them. But at the same time, they can't pinpoint it. Sometimes they can't even describe it. It's so profound. It's beyond our realm of thinking. That's right. And so all the time when I hear about humming and I see these, you know, very, very physical, very, very earth-based sightings, it, it very much makes me think that these are people that are, they're having an experience. What that experience is, we don't know. But it, it I don't think it's alien. I think if it was that. alien, it, yes, I think it, if you look at old world alien encounters, we're talking 1800s prior, they mm-hmm. are incredibly profound spiritual experiences. Most of them are not bad. Most of them are not scary. Most of them are profound. I mean, again, it's people that are seeing something, almost all of them equated to angels. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of theories about, you know, Mary Magdalene and, you know, the that all that shit, you know, with Jesus and stuff and, you know, aliens and divine conception and all this. I think a lot of what, again, what we see and the reason why I continue to be able to highlight, uh, you know, every single one of these, yeah, it might be alien, but... Look at this, you know, example A, B, and C of why it also might be human-based technology. I look Mm -hmm. at it the same way a court of law. I say this a lot with evidence. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's what I'm looking for. And I know it's an intangible. I know that. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm looking for. And and, And 
it it might not be something that's like you know beyond a reasonable doubt for somebody else there might be somebody else that goes well no i i have doubt about that but i i to me it convinces me that's what i'm looking for that convincing thing that go, and there's a bunch of them in the old world mm-hmm. you go and you look at ancient the ancient past a lot of that stuff is where i think the 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 authentic visitations happened that, that because it was beyond our reach that's right and in many of those cases, it helped humanity. And now what is it? It's just people see shit. Now, what is it doing for humanity? It's not doing anything. So that's the difference. That's the biggest difference for me. So anyways, but as I always say, what do you all think? What do you all think about this? The Petrovatsko, whatever the fuck, Petra Zavatsk jellyfish sighting and all these other jellyfish sightings. Nate, what's what's your what's your takeaway from this? Well, kind of makes me want to grab my jellyfish catching net and see if I can't prove something. <laughs> there you go. Jellyfish catching net. Mm-hmm. I can't do the SpongeBob laugh. I can't reach that octave, so I apologize. Oh, me neither. I, no, no. You guys all just have to do it in your brain. I could do some fun voices, but not, not that, that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I'm I'm still on the fence. Could be alien. Could be secret technology. Could be natural. I don't think it's natural phenomena. That that one, I I don't think. No. I, I don't I don't see it being natural phenomena. Uh, if it is, um. We would we'd have would have seen this more often. This specific, you know, the the burn the holes and the the coin the coin size holes, the melted mm-hmm. glass. We would see more of that. Um, and so I ju- I just don't see it how it's natural, but but definitely still on the fence whether it's uh, human or alien. But again, I want to know what you all think. I want to know. Yes, please. I want to know. Tell me. Whisper it in our ears. That's right. Whisper sweet nothings in mm-hmm. our ears. That's right, indeed. Uh, so, like I said, if you uh, let let me know what you think about this. If you have stories, you have experiences. Look, I know we poke fun at a lot of things. So, if you're worried that I'm going to make fun of you, I might. But it's all in love. And, you know, look, I want to believe. So, you know, don't throw me some bullshit story that I'm going to make fun of. Throw me something tangible that we can sink our teeth into. Have some fun with. You know, like uh, Josh, right? Wasn't it Josh that gave us some stories from Camp Verde, Arizona? Yeah. Yeah. Josh gave us stories. Give us some stories. We read them on the air. You can, yay, get your stories and we'll do it here too. As well as you can text or call. Got a phone number now, a new one. For the show, that's right, 208-477-1288. And I'll put that in the link in the show notes. You guys check it out. It goes directly to us, and I want to play the voicemails on the phone. Or I'm sorry, on the show. Yeah, right? Wouldn't it? It'd be super fun. Mm -hmm. So anyways, call that number, 208-477-1288. Leave us a voicemail, and, uh, and we'll play it on the show. So... And I, I give some instructions when you call. You get a little voice recording from me explaining again what I want from you. So just follow the instruction. Do what I told you. Uh, <laughs> you can also email I want to believe 115 at gmail.com. Uh, also, again, in the show notes, check it out. Of course, you can always join the Tinfoil Militia. Get access to all oh, things yeah. UFO know and get direct access to me uh, and Nate through our Patreon page and all that shit where I, I will answer every question, talk to you about the show. Um, you have direct access to us, so it's fantastic. Uh, and again, every episode, thanks to the Tinfoil Militia members who are, of course, give you some music, gang. Casey Armadillo, Michael Ralston, Rihanna Little, the OG supporter, Aaron Rice, Jesse, Jet Life Teague, Michael Benavides. 
Carlton Turner, Matthew Morfitt, Morgan, of course, our very own, very handsome Nathan Boldly Gun Higby. Sports show, yeah, time, baby. talent, and treasure. Uh, and again, like I said, you too could be a part of the Tin Floyd Militia at patreon.com slash UFO No Podcast, where I release bonus episode every single week, plus the regular episode. That's two episodes every single week. Sometimes uh, a third episode in there every once in a while. Uh, I get a little uh, a little extra content-y and uh, throw some extra shit out. And then, of course, as always, uh, any donation means the world to me, so go and get involved. I want you all in this with me. Let's get this list of growing the tinfoil militia. Uh, and now for general shout outs, my good friend Casey Leesky works at the shop with me and a listener of the show. What's up, bud? And Black Coast Killer Band of the UK with their brand Wet Wired. Go and check those guys out. Always giving us shout outs. Thank you so much, dudes. Those guys are always touring and always looking like they're having a blast. Um, follow them on Instagram, man. They're a great follow. Uh, Matthew Morford, again, I got to give you another shout out, dude, because you've given us some great uh, show ideas as far as uh, Valiant Thor, Galactic Federation, some of the sightings, like the top 10 sightings was his idea. Uh, I'm still working on one, which is every country's Roswell. We've talked about a couple. Um, yeah, we were talking about doing a little more serious this time, too. We kind of had a little fun with the last one. So. Yeah, we did. We had some fun. We just poked on some of our the ones that made us laugh. But I, I definitely do. Yeah. like uh, The ones that are the most convincing. The most, mm-hmm. to me, the most, the ones that make me question the most, whether it is alien or not. Uh, our positions in life. That's right, just life in general. Make us question everything. Uh, then, of course, for the reviews, Ridiculous Patronus, one, your scented memory, Gigi Holland, the Slime King, plays. Uh, thank you all for your reviews. And then my sister, Christy, the whole family, Jesse, Zoe, Emma, thanks for listening. And that another good good old one for Josh and Jay Fry, of course, for reaching out. Let me know you listen to the show. Thanks, guys. Um. On a personal note, I have to say this. Look, I, you know, we're, it's Thanksgiving. Talking about what we're thankful for, right? That's kind of the what's on everybody's minds. Mm-hmm. I know I say all the time I'm very appreciative of the Tinfoil Militia, but I'm thankful that I have been able to do this podcast and actually reach out and talk to some people. It has been amazing to meet the folks, the Tinfoil Militia members, and everyone else who's reached out and said that you listen to the podcast, check out the podcast. My personal friends, my personal family that all were just like, do it, man, do it. Uh, you, Nate, of course, for helping me out, being on the show with me. Uh, my friend oh, Bill. You're welcome, man. Yeah. Thank you. My friend Bill that helps out with uh, the other bonus episode. And, of course, Blind Mike, wherever he is out there in the cosmos, those goddamn aliens. Uh, we're always thinking about him. But uh, the other thing I want to mention is this. My mom was recently diagnosed with cancer and Mm -hmm. it just makes me think of all the things I'm thankful for. And one of those things goes out to you and your family, man. I hope she, she recovers fast. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's been a good prognosis so far. She had surgery. It was breast cancer. They were able to remove the tumor. Um, Looks like the cancer is not spreading. So that's cool. Um, but you know, time will tell. Uh, but the biggest thing is that, uh, and of course you guys already support me so much, but I just, you know, have to put that out there is that we started to go fund me because for those of you that know, and for those of you that don't know, cancer is a motherfucker, but it is incredibly expensive and we, yeah, fuck cancer hard. Uh, we live in a small area, so, you know, she has to travel almost 100 miles in order to go to the hospital to, to get her appointments done. So it's a lot of hotel stays, things like that, back and forth. And so I just wanted to, you know, I'm, you know, I just love and appreciate everything you guys do for the show. And, and so I, I just wanted to put that out there because if nothing else, if nothing else, I'm just looking for positive vibes Positive vibes, positivity, good mm-hmm. thoughts. Sending help, that look, guys. That's right. Helpful energy pushed our way. Um, 
But I will put a link in the show notes to the GoFundMe because if you find that you can go deeper than just positive energy and vibes, please throw it our way in the GoFundMe. Um, we all love our mamas. That's right. Uh, and so anyway, so uh, wanted to put that out. I've actually, you know, this actually happened in September. And I've been, you know, I don't do feelings mm-hmm. that good. <laughs> it's the most yeah. dumb way I can put that. And so it's hard for me sometimes to express these things. So I just hold on to them until I find a way that I can, I can adequately express myself and how I'm trying to do this. And, uh, and also, you know, like I, I just didn't want to, you know, you guys support me and I just didn't want to, sometimes people take it and it it becomes a negative. They get sad. It makes them sad hearing that somebody Mm -hmm. has cancer. And so I didn't know if I Mm -hmm. wanted to put that in the show. You know what I mean? I didn't know if I wanted to bring mm-hmm. that into the show, but I feel like it's good, man. You're my friends and my family, you know, extensions of that. And so, uh, so I, I felt like I wanted to share with you. So anyways, I'd be thankful for family. That's right. You know? That's right. That's right. And it, it just got me thinking about everything. So the positivity you guys bring me, that's what I'm hoping to bring my mom, an extension of that. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you love the show, if you love what we do here, please take a little moment, put your hands together. If you pray, say a little prayer. Um, if you just, if you can just put out some positive vibes, that'd be amazing. Uh, because I love what you guys do for me, and so I just want to share that with my mom. Anyways, but that's it. That's all. That's all. That's all as far as I'm going to go. But anyways, I appreciate you all. Love you all. I hope you fun- absolutely have a phenomenal phenomenal turkey day and i hope you absolutely stuff yourself don't get too sick don't drink and drive be safe be happy uh go tell somebody you love them nate i love you buddy love you too man happy thanksgiving everybody yeah man and as always make sure you go follow nate boldly gone on the facebook Mm -hmm. and of course ufo no podcast facebook page that nate so kindly curates for us and uh and then go follow that link in the show notes. Everything to go find the uh, the merch, all that good jazz. And again, I'll put the number in the f- uh, the link in the show notes and uh, give us a little shout. I'd love to hear your voices on the show. It'd be so much fun. It would be great. It would be great. So, anyways, with that on this wonderful Turkey Day, as I always say, stay elevated, keep your eyes to the skies, and watch out for the government. They're shysty bastards.